Oops. Okay, here we are, Object Oriented Part 10. Um, this is the tenth in a series of, of videos, uh, short videos that are actually trying to introduce you and realize that every one of these videos is the equivalent of three or four college um, lectures. So the idea is not for you to learn everything, the idea is just to introduce you to this stuff and then you can do more research by following the links or you know asking questions or what have you so programming part 10 and yep we're going to give you more vocabulary so go ahead and shoot me but unfortunately vocabulary terminology all this stuff is important in this world so far we've covered all of these keywords and functions true and false those are boolean results init which is your constructor that you can do after the factory constructor the plus sign with strings which really means concatenate we've talked about append class cmath def and all the other ones that are listed here so that's not too bad so far we've done 29 28 27 keywords something in that neighborhood now these are the keywords that as beginners you could do a lot of software with already but let's explore a few more again there's a link there that you can go ahead and click on if you want to get more information on any of these things but these are the ones we're going to talk about next so there's another 14 here with these keywords and functions you could do a lot of software a lot and certainly enough software that you would be proficient in in Python and in object-oriented languages so let's dive right in more of these crazy words functions methods procedures and subroutines yep they all sound like the same thing but the documentation will reference all of these. So let's go one by one. A function is a segment of code that is not part of an object that may or may not accept an input parameter and usually, almost always, returns a value or a set of values. A procedure is basically the same thing as a function, but it does not return a value. Usually you use this to set up equipment or do some kind of, of process that doesn't require an output. A subroutine, that is a multi-line segment of code that is inside another function. Maybe you use this because you're writing a complex um, method and there's a little tiny thing that you do over and over again depending on where you are typically the reason for a subroutine. It may or may not accept parameters and it may or may not return any values. An inline function is exactly like a function, except it's enclosed inside a larger expression and it is exactly equal to one line, it cannot have two lines. It may or may not accept parameters and return values, and in many languages, including Python, they're called lambda functions. Don't ask me why, I've never gotten a good reason for that. Finally, method, which is something we have talked about, is a segment of code that is indeed associated with an object. Again, it may or may not accept an input parameter or parameters, and usually returns a value or a set of values. Now, you might say, these seem like really stupid differences, which is uh, the name of this next screen. Seems like stupid differences. Yep, it does seem stupid to differentiate between these things. I mean, they're essentially the same, you could say. Python is the epitome of an object-oriented programming language. Almost, and I mean really, almost everything is an object. Therefore, almost all chunks of codes are actually methods. Well, if it's a method, then you know by definition that it's associated with an object. And it is almost never an only child. 
since it's almost never an only child, it implies that there are other methods that do all kinds of cool things. Also, because it is part of an object, you can improve on this object by simply inheriting the thing, okay? So, string, yep, it's a type of variable, but it's actually an object. Format is a method of the string object, and it has other methods like lower, upper, uh, trim, uh, capitalize words, capitalize every other word, and all kinds of things like this. You go on the link, and boom, sure enough, you can get all of these string methods. Python does have some built-in functions, but very, very, very few compared to other languages. You click on that link, you can see what they are, and we've actually covered more than half of them. Your main program may indeed, it is allowed to include functions and procedures, but it's rare. And it's usually not good programming practice in object-oriented programming. Functions and procedures, almost by definition, are very, very difficult to reuse. And this is not what we want to do. We want to write things one time and never write it again. Complicated methods may include an internal function or procedure. And again, this is rare because we want a method to do one thing and one thing only. <clears throat> and because of that, we usually want methods to be shorter than about two dozen lines, which is about what you can look at in one screen. So you really don't see that very often. Inline functions are very useful in complicated expressions, and it's used a lot to do sorts. So let's talk about one line functions and methods. A one line method or function, it, again it depends on how you define it, because you could define lambdas as either methods or functions, is really mostly for saving space. It's never strictly necessary. Sometimes it helps in not repeating yourself. It is very often used in sort and in inline just uh, list generation, which is something else we haven't covered, but just realize that you would use a lambda. Lambdas are defined in this matter. You give it a name equals, you put the word lambda, you list the parameters, you put a colon, and then you do something. Sometimes the method name is not used at all, and that is what you would see in the documentation being referred to as an anonymous function. It is so unimportant we don't even give it a name so let's look at geometry stuff the snippet that you see here on the screen would be legal some people find it easier to read I personally do not but it's a matter of taste certainly saves space we could do the entire geometry stuff um, class that we had defined instead of in 60 lines we could probably do it in about 15 lines. On the other hand, hard disk space is so cheap these days that it seems to me that it's a matter of taste. So, let's talk about import. We've used import mostly because Eclipse automatically entered it for you because you probably didn't know when to use it. There are several forms of this very, very important statement. In fact, it's one of the building blocks of Python. Python, C, C++, and pretty much every modern language imports just about everything because of this whole idea of a method only doing one little tiny thing. So once you write it, it's good, you st stash it away in some library somewhere, and then you import it. So f the first type that we can use import is the one you've seen before. And you say import, and then the name of the package. It imports the entire package. So in this example, it, it imports the entire package called math. Now this may be a lengthy process. If you were to import the entire package of Kivi, especially if you do it in more than one or two modules, the program may take a minute to start up, maybe more. 
Not to mention, entire packages take up a ton of memory space. And I mean a lot, because some of these packages are huge. If memory was at a premium, like say for example in a tiny microprocessor, this could really be an issue. Form number two, you can import and then give it a new name. Maybe you don't like the word CMath. Maybe CMath has been updated and now it's CMath 2. In any case, you can import CMath as and then give it a new name. And it imports the entire package, but it gives it a new name. Now this is good because if you were writing a thousand lines worth of code and you have a feeling that CMath is going to become CMath 2 at some point, um, you would only have to change that one line because everywhere else in your code it would be complex math. Um, this doesn't happen very often anymore, but renaming is useful because you can make shorter names or names that are more meaningful to you or things like that. The third form is from math, import, and then list whatever methods you're importing. Now this only imports the attributes that are listed after the word import. Much, much quicker to start up and much less memory space. And I'll give you time to review that at your leisure. Slices. This is another important concept. Now this is a concept that dates back all the way to the 1960s, but it still confuses a whole lot of people. Few, and I say few, modern languages use it as extensively as Python. Python is sort of the leader in using slices because you can slice pretty much any list in Python. And in Python, you'll see as your programs grow that almost all of your variables are lists. So it's interesting. A slice and an index that we have talked about are two different things. Slices are cut from a list, but an index is a particular position of a list. So you can think of a slice as sort of fence posts that include a part of your list and excludes others. I'll let you read the screen at your leisure because it is going to take you a while to understand this, but the bottom line is you put a square bracket, you put what number you want to start with, so what index number you want to start with, then you put a colon and what index number you want to finish with, and that's pretty much what you do most of the time. But you can actually select every second item or every third item um, as well, and I'll let you look at that again at your leisure. Here are some examples Assuming that you have a variable called A and the string variable includes the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it's a string of 10 characters. And all these examples of different slices give you the result that it would be. Look at the bottom right hand corner and you'll notice that's a string. We call it Let's say that the string includes Python, so it's six characters long, and the indexes are zero through five, but you can actually refer to the indexes from the rear towards the front using negative numbers. So that's like negative one to negative six. Next is sorting. Okay, so you just created a masterpiece term paper, some short story, you wanna see what words you used and how often you use them. So the program that you are going to write after reading in the text, your program would separate the words and place them in a big long list and usually place them in alphabetical order, or perhaps by frequency of use, or I don't know how many times you use the letter Z. In any way, you're going to sort it. So there are two methods, sort method and the sorted function, and they do it very, very quickly. There's a link there for your um, documentation if you want to look at it. The, big difference is sort sorts the list in place sorted makes a new list 
and again I'm using the word list loosely because it could be just about any variable in Python. Here is a basic sort example and instead of reading it to you I'm just gonna uh, let you look at it. Um, suppose you have a list of a bunch of parachutes that you're selling online and some of them start with the word the and the rest of the name. You know, you see this a lot with uh, musical groups. And maybe you don't want to put every musical group that starts with the together. So you want to ignore that beginning word. And I give you an example here of what your shoots, maybe these are the names of your shoots. Now you could define a very short method that eliminates the word the. In fact, it's so short that it could be a lambda function. And you can look at the screen to see how that would work. And yes, if statements can be made in one line, you can click there for the documentation. Now, if we sort our parachute list, the output would be like you see here on the screen. And notice how the word the was ignored. The sort methods are guaranteed to be stable, which means they won't rearrange things just because you call it. So if you sort a list by sales amount, and then again by department, it would be like a multi-tiered sort in a typical spreadsheet program. It would be listed by department and then by sales amount. Sort and sorted only look at each item one time, and they are implemented in C, not C++, so it's basically machine language. Extremely fast, even for very, very long lists. And I know I'm running a little bit over 15 minutes, but uh, again, definitions are kind of a bore. So note the previous example used in this construct, shoots.sort, key equals such and such, reverse equals such and such. Now these are keyword arguments, and yes, one more vocabulary word for our dictionary. In Python, all arguments may be prefaced by their name. Keyword arguments must be prefaced by their name, and they must be after non-keyword arguments. So on the screen here, you could see that parachute stuff has para underscore cd equals zero, which makes it an optional argument. Now, I'm showing here five different ways that we could call that method with or without keywords and with or without the optional um, parameter. Adding the name of the parameter when you write your code makes reading your code a year later a whole lot easier. So why do we do all these crazy things? If you're familiar with BASIC or Fortran or Pascal or any of those, you're wondering why we need to do all of these crazy things just to calculate a simple terminal velocity. Well, this will become much clearer as the programs go and get bigger and bigger and they grow more complex. So these are concepts we are introducing slowly. <clears throat> you can look these up on the net, but separation of concerns, SOC, because we all love acronyms, each piece of code should only do one action, but it should do it really well. And then there's model view controller. This is where we separate how we interface with the user, that's the view, how we actually store the data, that would be the model, and how we process that data, or the actual logic, that's the controller. And each are in separate files. And the reason we do this, again, goes back to not repeating yourself. It allows changes in one to not affect the other two pieces. It makes debugging much, much easier. If you're interested in this, again, there is a ton of information available on the internet. And this is the end of number 10. Hope you enjoyed it.